over two sets, uh, well, really conceptually three, um, we have three sort of types of quarry this morning. The first, we're gonna be going over the take home exercise, which I, um, uh, which I asked you to undertake for today. Um, and which um, asked you to struggle with uh, uh, finding the equilibria associated with a, uh, a model uh, uh, characterized by a set of ordinary differential equations, ordinary first order differential equations at a technical level. Um, and uh, that's a good exercise uh, for everyone to go through, not least because it's a sort of exercise that almost invariably tends to make its, make its way to the uh, final exam. It's also amenable to a set of uh, basic guidelines for how to proceed, which uh, can be conveyed um, in office hours uh, or where necessary on a one-to-one -one basis. So if, if you uh, found it uh, overwhelming, uh, if you found yourself um, uh, just utterly confused, uh, we, we should talk. And I think uh, there's every reason to believe that we can, um, we can straighten out those confusions and uh, help you proceed in a systematic way. But I do wanna go over the, uh, the solutions to it as I undertook them, recognizing that there's a certain amount of latitude one has in, in, in the details of how to go about, um, about solving uh, a series of equations like this. So that's uh, item one. Uh, item two, we're going to be uh, going through and discussing some of the mathematics associated with vaccination. Um, and you'll see emerging from that discussion uh, matters uh, that you'll see in the news these days, discussion of what it takes to reach our herd immunity in terms of a vaccination of the population. Um, and uh, hopefully you'll get some appreciation for um, where statistics uh, bandied about for that. For example, that three quarters of the population have to, have to be uh, vaccinated um, or two thirds. What, what assumptions lie behind those numbers? And you'll see the, the formulae, uh, but more, more importantly, the, um, uh, the intuitions and uh, the, the deeper conceptual understanding out of which those formulae arrive, arise. Um, and uh, then as time allows, uh, we may further discuss some aspects associated with another intervention, um, uh, quarantining um, or isolation of people in a population with which you folks have uh, I, I was going to say enjoyed a measure of, acqu uh, of acquaintance, but uh, uh, you've, you've certainly encountered it. Um, so those are our goals for today. And I'd like to uh, dive in forthwith uh, to the first of them. So uh, with my screen now uh, due, due to be shared, I will switch over to that and uh, we will get today's uh, slides up. I apologize, I didn't have a chance to post these just before class, um, but I guess uh, I might as well do that right now so that all of you enjoy recourse to them and you can, you can uh, move forward and backwards in them. So uh, if you give me a moment, um, or probably a minute, uh, I can do that. In the meantime, I'll start discussing the exercise. So th the exercise was such that um, we took a system uh, that was characterized as SIR. Um, and we added uh, a representation of population turnover. Turnover in the form of people uh, coming into the population and people leaving the population. And um, to simplify the mathematics for you um, and to, to make it a little bit easier to, to take on as a take home exercise rather than a full assignment problem, I uh, further imposed a key assumption, which is that the population turnover was in some sense balanced. That is um, the, the number of people coming into the population per unit of time equaled the number of leaving. And uh, whilst that may not be true uh, in all its details, populations do 
enjoy net out migration or net in migration. Often it's a good enough approximation if your focus, for example, is on just a few years um, or you know, just a single season of an outbreak. Um, you may reasonably approximate the population as being in balance, as being um, uh, you know, a one where the, there's uh, net zero population turnover. Um, so again, it, it has to do with the, the purpose of the model, and in this case, the time horizon. So uh, in this case, we, we uh, had this uh, series of equations here. Um, we had people coming in, all of them assumed to come into the S state, the susceptible state, and people leaving from any of these states via the process that could represent death, uh, it could represent uh, out-migration, or some combination of them. And both those are associated with this rate constant, this chance per unit time of variously coming in or, or leaving of omega. Uh, now, it should be noted that the fact that these individuals came into the susceptible compartment, um, you could think of this N as being the whole population and omega as being a birth rate here, um, you know, the birth rate of 2% would mean uh, if you have a population of 1,000, you'd have 20 people born per year, say, if it's an annual birth rate of 2%. Um, that presupposes that all the births come into the susceptible state. And there are some conditions, tragically, where there's what's called vertical transmission. And um, uh, a mother uh, during pregnancy may uh, pass on an infection um, uh, to to, to the baby uh, at birth or, or even prior to birth. And uh, that can lead to, you know, an inflow into the I state, for example, um, you know, typically not into the R state. So it's not universal that when you have a population turnover, you always have people coming in only to I or to S rather, but it's very common. Um, so, so we saw these underlying equations and we noted that um, these equations, when you look at them, have a certain regularity that you should be able to learn to read. Uh, these two blue squares are just, you know, two faces of the same flow. They're just the two ends of it, the, the end where it's coming from which it's coming and the end to which it's going. And the same thing with the, uh, the red there. Um, but we undertook a further simplification here, given that, um, we have the same number of people coming in or as are leaving. After all, S plus I plus R is N. So we have omega times S plus I plus R, people leaving. In other words, omega times N people leaving, omega times N people coming in per year or whatever your time unit of choice is. Um, S plus I plus R is fixed. It's, it's um, constant, it doesn't change. And what that means is that people in the entire population are either in S, uh, in I, or in R. There's a fixed total size population. So if we know S and I, we can derive what R is. So R is just N, the total population minus sum of S plus I. So this is often, what, when you can undertake this, um, it's a great uh, first, uh, first step um, within simplifying uh, your task. Uh, it's not required, uh, but it, it really means you uh, have to deal with, um, with less uh, sort of algebra. Um, you're, you're only solved for two things rather than for three things. And that's a lot easier. Um, okay, so, so here we had um, uh, this series of equations. We simplified it in this way. Now you tell me, and I would like people to speak up here, um, we're trying to solve this series of equations for, for equilibria, for equilibria where the system is at rest, often because those are the long, represent the long-term behavior of the system, the behavior towards which it gravitates over time, things like the endemic equilibrium. Um, so we're searching for equilibria. So what do I wanna solve for here? Um, I have these equations, that's great. What am I trying to solve for? 
what what are the conditions that I want to solve for? Where what equals what? S dot I dot equals zero. Okay, sorry, you're you're speaking into my headphones, which is um, um, unfortunate because I don't have them on. So so could you say that again? S dot and I dot equals zero. Yeah, S dot and I dot is zero. And I mean, what that means is they're not changing, all right? They're not going up, they're not going down. And both of them have to be equal to zero simultaneously. Um, it's not one or the other, it's both equal zero. So both are in stasis. And by implication, R will be in stasis. I mean, amongst other things, if you take, there's R equals N minus S plus I. If you take dr dt, that's R dot, it's equal to dn dt, which is zero, n isn't changing, minus ds dt minus, and, and, you know, or minus the, the sum of ds dt and di dt. Uh, in other words, s, uh, s dot and i dot. So if s dot and i dot are, are zero, r dot has to be zero. Um, the s dot and i dot is everything except r in the population. So it's gotta be zero. Okay, so, um, we're going to be solving s dot and i dot equal to zero. And uh, in order to take this on, we're going to divide this into two cases, uh, these upper two. And we saw those two cases last time, but I want you to remind me of what those, uh, those are. And I want to focus, you know, like when I, when I look at these things, um, uh, these, these sets of equations, I look for certain patterns that whisper to me of an easier job. They, they suggest to me an easy route. And one of the things that immediately stands out is for I dot, we have I in every term. And that's an invitation for simplification. We can kind of, after all, I, I should have emphasized this. We're solving for S dot and I dot equals zero. What, what are we trying to find out what are we solving for? For what are we solving? It's values of, of what that make S dot equal I dot equal zero. It's values of what? The state S variables. I. Yeah, the state variables, S and I. G good, both of you are exactly right, S and I. Um, we want to find out the state of the system, the, the kind of situation of the system when it's in balance because we want to know how many infectives are there going to be in that state, how many susceptibles and how many recovers, right? Um, if it's going to stay circulating in the population, we want to know, it, are the infected people going to be 90% of the population or, or you know, 0.1%? Um, that could make a big difference if you're planning hospital capacity, et cetera. Okay, so we want to solve for, for those things. And, and look, I mean, one way to solve for them is, you can be solving for the minus well group terms which involve them, right? So the second one has I terms across all of it. So I can kind of group them together uh, all out in front and I get rid of the I's in there and, and the only things that are left are constants and beta. Um, uh, these Greek, sorry, these Greek constants and S, excuse me, um, the state variable. Uh, so that's a route to simplification. Uh, th that's one way I follow my nose. Um, and so you can, you can try to simplify that term and that will immediately bring up the question, okay, how could this second term be equal to zero? And you're gonna tell me what are two ways that this second term could be, could be equal to zero? If, if, if we recognize that i's in every one of these terms, what's one way this could be equal to zero? If what equals what? If I equals zero? If I equals zero, the second, this, this I dot has to be equal to zero. Um, so, so that's one way. Um, if, if, uh, if I is zero, I dot is, has got to be zero. But there's another way too. If I is not zero, there's going to be some complex term here, uh, which, which has got to be zero because I times that complex term equals zero. Um, rearranging the I's, pulling them out, we have a complex term which is left, right? Um, and one of them has to be zero. If you have A times B equals zero, either A has got to be zero or B has got to be zero or both, right? Okay, so we're going to solve for those two cases. Okay, now 
you might think, well, okay, if I is zero, we're, our work is done, but that's, that's not true, actually. We still have to solve for what? If I is zero, we still have to solve for? S. S, yes. yeah. Okay, so, so look, um, uh, one thing that, that we can do here is, okay, I uh, mumble, um, right. Um, so this, this slide is out of order, for, but uh, basically for the endemic equilibrium uh, for, for I equals zero, uh, we have this um, uh, remaining term. So we've already said I dot equals zero, fine. Now we've got to deal with S dot. Um, and, uh, and we know S dot equals zero, but moreover, we know that I is equal to zero. So that cancels out this second term. Right, uh, this term with c times i over n. So all we're left with is omega times n minus, that's from here, minus omega times s, which is just omega times n minus s equals zero. And again, assuming that indeed we have a population turnover, we have a population which where people are leaving it coming in, omega is not zero. So that applies s equals m, right? So, so we get something like, like this. Everyone is susceptible. That's what that's saying, right? Everyone is susceptible, no one is infective, and no one is recovered. So that's the disease-free equilibrium. And you can see it's disease-free. There's nobody sick, I equals zero. That's why it's called that. So that's the easier case, um, but we still had to do some math involving the other factoid we were given, which is s dot equals zero. And we had to solve for what s is um, and, and solve for r based on s and i. Okay, so that was the disease-free equilibrium. Um, fairly straightforward. Now we've got to deal with this endemic equilibrium, right? Um, okay. Um, so for the endemic equilibrium, um, we basically can divide I through in this I dot term. We had I in every one of these terms, so we could just divide by it. Since I is not zero, there's no problems, right? Um, so we'll get the things without I left over. Um, and, and so that's this complex term, which of which I had spoken earlier. Um, so um, this term, if I is, not equal to zero, this term has to be equal to zero because I times it is zero. One of them has to be equal to zero. So this, this term has to be uh, equal to zero. And now we can solve this term for, what can we solve this term for? What is this really tempting to solve it for? When I see this, I, you know, that's that like, just beckons me. That's that's just ripe for the pickings. What can I solve this for? S. 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 It's the only state variable in there. S. Solve for it. Yeah. Um, so I go through some simplification steps, multiply by the constants to get rid of the pesky fractions. And and so I'm multiplying times n and tau, and you know, they all sort out in the wash. Um, here and uh, you go put these things on uh, on the uh, the right there, and uh, and that just sort of distributing it, you you get um, uh, you get that, and uh, and you divide through by c tau beta, um, or I really should have called it by reference last time, and to emphasize the recurrent point, this is c beta tau, um, so. Um, here, by knowledge that I is not equal to zero, we were able to get rid of one of the state variables, I from this, by dividing through by it and solve for the other one, S. And then all we do is um, now we, we have to get a term for I. Well, um, that's where that previous slide came in, which I'll show you now. So we solve for S here. And now we have to solve for, for, for basically I. And so um, here we could solve for I in terms of S, okay? 
The other thing we know is, is this thing. We've already used up our information from this to solve for S. And that's great, but now we got to solve for I. All we know is that I is not equal to zero, but we got to solve what's its value. What's its value? Um, the knowledge that was not equal to zero allowed us to get to the point where we could solve for S from the equation for I dot uh, equals zero. But we, we haven't yet really used this S dot equals zero fact yet. And so we need to mine that. We need to mine that for what we could use it for, having solved for S. And the good thing is this S dot, if we substitute in for S here, um, after all, we have a solution for it, um, uh, this thing right here, in terms of constants, if we if we substitute that in, uh, then uh, the only state variable we have left is i, and we can solve for that. And so that's what's going on here. Um, but um, here I chose to to just go through and simplify this solving for i in terms of s, and and I got this term. I mean, basically, it's a bunch of high school algebra, right? You 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 can go put this term on the other side and you have this minus that. And uh, then you can go through and uh, divide, uh, divide through by these factors from the right and, um, and rearrange things. You've got I over there and you get something like this coming out uh, where I equals this. So we have it in, ter in terms of S, but we solved earlier for S so we could just substitute it in. So we substitute the definition of N in here and, um, and we end up getting uh, a solution for I as well. Um, and, uh, and, and this is uh, the formula for I down at the bottom, um, having substituted in the value for S. Um, okay, so this is what we get out. So the endemic equilibrium here, um, we again have some rather pleasing results once you look beyond the kind of Greek uh, soup that that you have and you you start to think about what it really means. Um, and I'd encourage you to do this. And I'd encourage you on the final exam to do some simple sanity checks here. You know, for example, um, we know we need to have S plus I plus R to total up to be the whole population at, in this case. We need everything to be non-negative, to be zero or more. And you need it to have behavior that when you consider extremes, like extreme values of population turnover or no population turnover at all, you get sensible behavior out of it. Uh, and indeed, we can see that here. So I'd like to walk you, you through these things. I would note that once again, all these constants, as is typical, are of unit dimension, meaning they're dimensionless. Um, if C is persons per person per unit time that are mixed with by a given susceptible and beta is itself uh, a fraction of, of, of infections that lead to uh, to infection, it's like a coin flip. It's number of heads in the numerator, number of total number of coin flips in the denominator. The units cancel, and tau is is time. Um, the multiplication of them is dimensionless. It doesn't matter whether we measure it in thousands of people, or per person, or millions of people. Um, moreover, uh, the same thing is true as omega tau, omega here is, um, is, is of uh, unit uh, one over time, tau is time. Uh, so that also is, is rather, um, uh, is, is dimensionless. Okay, so let's, let's sort of reason through some of the intuition here. So um, first of all, Im imagine a case where um, we have no population turnover. So omega is equal to zero, okay? Now, uh, in that case, we, we're going to have just one here and the fraction of the population that is susceptible 
is the total population divided by C beta tau. What is C beta tau? Anyone? Basic reproductive number. It's a basic reproductive number. It's how many people an infective will infect in a population that's otherwise entirely susceptible over the entire course of their illness. They're mixing with C people total per unit time. All of those people are presumed to be susceptible. So C times beta is treated as the, the number of people on average they're going to infect. So if they're mixing with 100 people per day, let's say, and they have a 10% chance of infecting each of the people they mix with, they are going to on average infect 10 people per day. And that's per day. And if they're sick for a total of a week, seven days, they're going to be infecting 70 people before they, they uh, recover. Wow, that's pretty bad uh, for a basic reproductive number. Um, but, and over this, you may recall, it's the fraction that remains susceptible at the final time. And we'll go over that reasoning again after this exercise. Um, so, so that accords with our earlier characterization of what fraction remain susceptible um, when a, an outbreak sweeps through the population. That's the level of susceptibility at which it will no longer pay for an infective to be infected. They're no longer going to infect any more than one person before they recover. Okay, um, let's let's look at other uh, components of this though. Um, when omega t equals uh, zero, then here in uh, the infective uh, component, we're going to have um, uh, so we're going to have omega t be zero, and we have omega t times this entire thing. So zero people are going to remain infective uh, in that uh, in that state for the endemic equilibrium. Yeah, there's there is no endemic equilibrium if there's no population turnover. It doesn't sustain itself. The wood gets used up. Okay, and what fraction are remain uh, or are recovered? Well, uh, omega t is zero, so we have. Uh, C beta tau minus one here. Um, and uh, that stands to reason because both this is one, this is C beta tau minus one. You sum them up as C beta tau, multiply it times this thing up front and you get N. So basically the fraction that remain susceptible is, is going to be one over the basic reproductive number of the population and the rest are going to be recovered. Okay, so that accords with, um, with sense, um, you know, for that limited case. Now let's take the case where omega tau is, is really big, it's huge. It, it, as we say, it goes to infinity. It's, it's, it's getting larger and larger. Think of it getting larger and larger. What, what's going to, result from that. Well, let's let's think because tau is out in front too. Let's just think about omega getting bigger and bigger. Just just omega getting larger and larger. Um, what this is going to say is okay, there's more and more population turnover. Uh, people are are dying and they're coming in. M more and more quick refreshes of the what population of the If, if you have tons of people being born per unit time, they're going to be coming into what state variable? Susceptible. Susceptible. Yeah, so we're going to have a lot of people in the susceptible state. But there's also going to be a lot of infections occurring. And so omega tau up front here is going to be really large. Um, and, and basically, you're going to get... If you, if you think about it, um, omega tau here is gonna get really large as omega goes towards infinity. One plus omega tau is gonna get really large too. And the, and the one, I mean, that's gonna be a tiny thing compared to omega tau. So, so basically it's gonna be something like omega tau times C beta tau over omega tau. The one is, is small potatoes. Um, and so if you, 
you could you could think of even those uh you know multiplying through to cancel and you get something like uh c beta tau but you do have this this minus minus one term but basically omega tau is going to be dominating the bottom and you're going to have something like c beta over omega once the tau's cancel there and and minus one so you're going to have a large fraction that remain um infective at, at any one time and uh in this uh recovered state you're going to have uh omega going to infinity is going to bring this uh down to uh actually in, in value to a lower level it's going to reduce it quite a bit and what that's going to mean is that there's not going to be so many recoveds because they're they're dying off and there's going to be people coming in so so here we're going to have different fractions of the population that remain susceptible uh under different values of these parameters and if you look at the extremes um you should get some um some sensible uh, sensible understanding let's consider as as c beta tau goes to infinity or think about let's say c goes to infinity well um basically what's going to happen is uh you're going to have more and more of the population concentrated in r um and you're going to have fewer and fewer left over for the endemic equilibrium in s um and uh you're going to have quite a few though uh, here also in in the infective state in this endemic equilibrium it's more that you're 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 not going to have as many in this in the susceptible state it's ripping through the population so there's going to be quite a few infectives and there's going to be quite a few um recovers but not many uh susceptibles there um so that's a little bit about how that uh behaves um there's some subtleties here for example you'll notice that you have these minus 1 terms and this is telling us something um it's unphysical if you have a negative value here so you know an endemic equilibrium is not going to exist if one of these terms goes below 0 um and you should be able to think what those terms mean you'll notice it's the same term here c beta tau over 1 plus omega minus 1 that appears both in the second position for i and the third position for r the only difference between i and r is the ratio between them which is omega tau the more and more population turnover there is the larger the ratio of infectives to recovers or equally so the the larger the larger the time until recovery you're going to have disproportionately more um in fact proportionally more uh infectives compared to recovered individuals it's just the ratio of it uh of this second term to the third term is omega tau um but this this term in parentheses here or the the last term here can never go below 0 and under what conditions will that be equal to 0 well uh it'll be equal to 0 uh under the the condition that 1 plus omega tau equals c beta tau right um and uh under that condition which we could uh you know rearrange a little bit but at at that point uh the endemic equilibrium if c beta tau is smaller than that the endemic equilibrium will not exist uh c beta tau basically the infection won't be spreading fast enough to keep a hold on the population here it's it's not just um c beta tau that has to be greater than um than 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 one uh to to remain uh to remain viable we also have this one over uh one plus omega tau that also has to be considered and so we need c beta tau over omega one plus omega tau 
a minus one to be uh, greater than or equal to zero. And that means C beta tau over one plus omega tau as a unit greater than or equal to one. Um, or C beta tau greater than or equal to one plus beta tau, uh, one plus omega tau here. So, so here we have a stricter criteria for C beta tau for the basic reproductive number. Not only does it need to be greater than one, it needs to be greater than one by an amount that takes into account the population turnover omega as well. And the higher that population turnover, it's got to it's got to be um, higher yet, um, uh, C, C beta tau. Okay, so that was some analysis. Any questions on that from students before we go on to some new material? Questions? Hello. That's Jeff. Um, I was curious about, because in the, in the exercise, uh, I think the, the system is the same, but the uh, just tau is called mu. Uh, are those equivalent? Good question. Um, yeah, that was my loss. Yeah, they're completely equivalent. So the, um, so in science more generally, um, science and engineering and mathematics, um, there's kind of this interesting convention that's literally built up over the course of centuries um, that denotes certain types of quantities in certain ways, okay? And it's a little bit frustrating for students getting into the research domain because they don't realize the, the connotations uh, associated with uh, symbols. And like, if, if you show someone um, a, a series of equations here, um, you would always write the state variables with capital letters, capital um, Roman letters like S, I, and R. Uh, and constants are traditionally written uh, in this sphere with Greek, Greek uh, letters. Now, um, in, in computer science, we also have these things, like something like K, a lowercase k, um, like invariably in computer science, it denotes an integer value, um, sometimes a natural number, zero or more, um, but it's like never a real number. It's, it, you know, you never use it to denote, uh, you know, pi or, or, or you know, uh, uh, 2.718 or something like that. It's, uh, it's always an integer. And there are certain of these symbols that denote like lengths of time uh, in, in this, this area and, um, or denote mean lengths of time. And so mu is one way to do that. It's very common to use that for an average uh, infection length. Another one is tau because tau, like tau is, sounds like time. Um, and uh, believe it or not, um, we, we tend to use it because it, it reminds us of, of the T in time. And, uh, and so tau is very commonly used and mu is very commonly used. And uh, uh, it, it tends to be used for a length of, of time. By contrast, something like alpha or something like omega, those tend to be used for like rate constants, like chance per unit time that someone will do something. Um, so leave a stock, for example. And, and that's why we have omegas here. It'd be kind of weird if we had this, you know, like I times tau and tau was a rate constant, a, a chance per unit time of leaving. That would be like, oh man, that's freaky. Um, you know, it gives me the heebie-jeebies. I don't, I don't wanna, uh, I, I, I don't wanna deal with that because it, it just runs afoul of how I think of tau as a length of time. And so you, you ran afoul of the fact that within the, um, the conventions of this area, two ways of denoting the average length of time infective are tau and, and mu. And I should have double checked, which I used in lecture and just made it consistent, apologies. But uh, yeah, so they're the same thing and they could be used identically. And it's a real number greater than or equal to zero. Hope that's helpful. Yep. Other questions?
Okay, hearing none, I'll just make one other meta level remark. What we're doing here, if it hasn't escaped you, uh, or if it has, in case it's escaped you, um, going up a level, what we're doing here is very powerful. We're, we're actually talking about how does the endemic equilibrium, the location at which the system is in balance vary over vast ranges of these parameters, C, beta, tau, omega. Um, and, and it's by virtue of our ability to work this through mathematically that we could, we could talk about how does this system behave for these vast different number of possibilities. You know, we're not running simulations for this. I'm, I'm not asking you to fire up any logic and run these things for different values of omega and C and tau, um, because we can solve for them in closed form where it will be a balance. That's very, very powerful. And it's unique in the three modeling disciplines to system dynamics here. It's unique to this way of characterizing the, the structure in terms of differential equations. Um, uh, the dynamical systems characterize the differential equations we can solve for. But we can go beyond that. We can solve for stability. And what that means is looking beyond the equilibrious location at what values of S, I, and R will it be in balance, but really asking where is it stably at balance? Meaning not only is it at rest, but it will stay at rest if it's disturbed. Like in this case, if you had a busload of 100 more people coming into Saskatoon infected with COVID-19, would it bounce back? Would it, okay, it's, maybe it's at rest of this endemic equilibrium. If they came in, would it just take off like wildfire and double and triple in size every month? Or would it, would it just come back to that endemic equilibrium? Equally much so, and very important, if we go through and vaccinate the population uh, against COVID-19 with Moderna and Pfizer and AstraZeneca uh, vaccinations, and we had 100 people coming to Saskatoon with COVID-19, would the infection take off? Um, is that stable? Is the disease-free equilibrium stable? These are key questions. And indeed, much of the design of our public health systems is designed precisely to guarantee this stability in the, forward, uh, in the form, for example, of herd immunity. And it's really that topic we're going to go to next. But don't lose track of the fact that what we're doing here goes beyond simulation. It's, it's about fundamental reasoning. And in fact, when we reason about the stability of these systems, we're reasoning about their stability uh, in a symbolic way. We say the conditions under which the disease-free equilibrium will be stable is if we have you know, no more population turnover than this, um, uh, or we have this fraction vaccinated based on C, beta, and tau. And we can reason about how it would change for a vast number of different uh, diseases or human behaviors um, in a very powerful way. And really that's what is afforded by the sort of representation of dynamics with using compartments, using these ordinary differential equations. Um, it allows us to reason symbolically rather than just running you know, millions of simulations with different possible parameter values. It allows us to identify broad generalities. It allows us to ask, at what point can we make an endemic equilibrium impossible by changing the public health system to respond quick enough, for example? Would we drive out the possibility of an endemic equilibrium? Or what do we need to do for COVID-19 so that once people are vaccinated, the population remains ever resistant to, to an outbreak, even if people come into town carrying the bug. Um, so that's a lot of, uh, lot of the power of these sorts of models. Um, 
And now this is going to bring us back uh, to some intuitions because we're going to go on and discuss uh, a topic directly related to that, which is the impact of vaccination. And I'm going to have to be pretty quick about this. Um, so you'll recall uh, that for all these models, we had this key term, um, this key nonlinear term involving new infections. And um, we have a number of susceptibles times the likelihood a given susceptible be infected per unit time. Um, and we, we termed it as S times the force of infection. That's the, that's the probability per unit time a susceptible will be affected. And we can write it like this, S times in this latter term is the force of infection. But by rearranging it, we see we get this, I times C times S over N times beta. Um, that's just this term rearranged, right? And you could think of that as the mean number of susceptibles affected per unit time by each infected. And we like to, this term S over N is so important what fraction of the firewood is used up, we call it F, okay? The susceptible fraction. And it really determines the efficiency of transmission. Okay, now I had argued from the seat last time that this susceptible fraction is of central importance because it throttles the degree to which the infection could spread. If we have very few susceptibles, each infective is surrounded by more and more people they can't possibly infect. They're not susceptible. They're, they're already infected or they were infected before and now they're recovered. So they got to work harder and harder to find susceptibles to infect. And the fundamental factoid here that we could take advantage of is the effective reproductive number for these uh, simpler models is just equal to the fraction susceptible times the basic reproductive number. Now, that's notable. So the basic reproductive number is the number of people an infective will infect over the course of their illness if everyone else is susceptible. So if F is one. Um, but if only half the people are susceptible, that infective will only infect half that number. So 0.5 times the basic reproductive number. If only 10% of the people around them are susceptible, not, uh, not 100%, but 10%, then it's going to be 0.1 times the basic reproductive number of people they infect on average, right? That's the number of people they infect on average, the effective reproductive number, also written uh, R of T or R sub T or R star or ERN for effective reproductive number. And it's a daily constant discussed and one that we report all across the country and for our province. Now, here's the key factoid though, that you gotta keep, on which you gotta keep your eye. At endemic equilibrium, I argued that the effective reproductive number is equal to what? At endemic equilibrium, where the system's in balance, not only does inflow equal outflow for, for the infective stock, but the effective reproductive number must equal what? One. 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 They infect one person before they recover, each infective. They nominate one person to replace them, and then they're out of there. And, and so it doesn't grow and it doesn't shrink, right? Um, they, they nominate a replacement. Um, now, it follows from this. If you put these two factoids together at endemic equilibrium, S times N, or collectively called F, times R, R naught equals one. And what that implies is that end, at endemic equilibrium, S divided by N must equal one over the basic reproductive number. That's the fraction of people who remain susceptible, that's S over N, in the endemic equilibrium. That's the fraction that are left over if an outbreak has swept through. 
we saw it in solving for that case of the open population. If if there's um, if there's no population turnover, that's the fraction that's uh, that remains susceptible there. Okay. Um, okay. Now uh, we saw that that gets adjusted a little bit here. That's by the way, this is n over the basic reproductive number. So if omega t is zero, that that's the fraction that remains susceptible. Uh, if omega t, if omega is large, this population turnover it boosts this uh, sum, right? The fraction that remains susceptible is larger because people are pouring in there. Okay, um, and uh, though we saw that this leads to behavior that's oscillatory, right? Um, but, uh, and we saw there's a disease-free and an endemic equilibrium. Okay, now, what I would like to talk about though, and we don't have uh, time to, to go into that, we talked about it some last time. I'd like to talk about the effects of vaccination. And we may, we may loop back to some of the issues with population turnover. Um, well, okay, I think we have a bit of time for it right now, just watching the time. So as you get more population turnover, um, it turns out that you get um, uh, a very real impact on a set of factors. So the, the faster the population turnover, um, the larger the outbreaks uh, will be here. So this is like blue is 20% population turnover uh, per year. Red is 10%. Uh, green is 5%. And uh, you'll see a couple of things. The slower the population turnover, it leads to lower minimum fraction of infectives. So infectives, which are actually shown here, the prevalence of infection, the fraction that are infective, goes to much lower levels. If you have very fast population turnover, it could stay pretty high because it's constantly getting new fuel added to the fire. So the fraction of, of, of infectives can remain high. But if you have slower population turnover, we have uh, fewer infectives between these peaks. Um, uh, it's... it's uh, you know, not got as much fuel for it. And so the, the number of infectives goes way down before it swoops up again for a subsequent outbreak. Um, so it leads, leads to lower minimum fraction of infective. It leads to less frequent outbreaks too. Slower population turnover, say 5% per year, that's green, compared to 10% per year, that's red, compared to 20% per year, that's blue. They lead to different spacings of outbreaks. Um, and you know, for for example, this green one, the next outbreak is is um, occurs much later than it does with twice that amount of population turnover or, or four times that amount. Um, it also takes a longer time till it when it reaches uh, endemic equilibrium. You notice the blue quickly approaches this endemic equilibrium. But this green is still oscillating in pronounced ways all throughout this time. And the red is somewhere in between. So a slower population turnover um, is going to mean a longer time to build up that fraction of susceptibles. And when it's slowly building it up early on, the infectives are going down and down and down because it's still below the endemic level that allows infectives to rise. So you're gonna be really depleting the infectives before you hit that endemic point. And then it's going to require a, a while for them to, to sort of uh, recover. Um, in terms of effective reproductive number, you're going to see um, uh, also sort of slower waves with, um, and, and uh, prolonged waves when you have slow population turnover. Take a look at the, the the gray wave here, for example, with 1% population turnover compared to the green with 5% or the red with 10%. You have this effective reproductive number 
that is oscillating, but it oscillates at, at different rates. And in a state space plot, we also see this. Um, here, uh, we have no birth and death. Here, we have high birth and death. Uh, modest birth and death leads to, so high birth and death is going to lead to a comparatively high fraction of infectives. And in fact, once it catches, the number of infectives never goes too low. Um, it doesn't, even between these peaks, it's staying, it's staying reasonably high. Um, it uh, also sort of quickly spirals in. Um, and there's, uh, there's not a very long time till it reaches endemic equilibrium. This is modest birth and death. You notice it comes lower before it goes up again. And um, it's, uh, it turns out it's less frequent. Um, there's sort of more spacing here than the tight spacing here. Uh, and uh, it takes longer till it really settles down compared to this. Here uh, with a very small birth and death rate, it's oscillating to very low levels and oscillating many times before it, it settles down. And you can get very low levels of infectives. So slow population turnover can lead to these pronounced uh, waves, these troughs and, and new waves that, that are characteristic of periodic outbreaks in things like uh, chickenpox and measles and mumps and rubella and all these childhood infectious diseases uh, pre-vaccination. By the way, this is when it's 0.01. You could see it's even more, takes a while yet to, to settle down. Okay, let's go into vaccination though. Um, we have about uh, 20 minutes uh, and I wanna, wanna cover this. Okay, so with births and deaths, a system can approach this endemic equilibrium. And you know the balance is such that the number of, uh, the inflow is equal to the outflows. Uh, so there's new infections uh, coming in um, uh, say there's new infections going out of the susceptible state. And for susceptible to be in balance, the inflow to susceptible has to be equal to the outflow. So the outflow is infections. The inflow is, well, population coming in, right? Births and maybe some immigration coming in. And then um, a rate of new infections, uh, you have... Uh, inflow equals outflow as well, although there may be a, a death or my out migration as well. Um, and we've seen the, the equilibria that, that occur here. We're going to add in a vaccinated stock here uh, to a model. So instead of just having SI and R, we're going to have an additional compartment that's vaccinated. In a traditional way, it's represented as like this. The idea is you're not going to vaccinate someone that's already recovered because they probably have natural immunity. If someone's infective, we're not going to vaccinate them. In general, we don't like to vaccinate people who are currently sick. Um, and we don't like to spread the infection by inviting infective people in. Now, that's sometimes hard to police or hard to be sure of, but generally, people who are susceptible are much more likely to get vaccinated. Um, and so we have the vaccinated stock. And, and what we're going to examine is two cases here. One, where we start a certain fraction of the population vaccinated instead of susceptible. And then we're gonna look at vaccination over time with some per unit time chance of getting vaccinated. Okay, so the key, the key, um, factoid we're going to uh, go to is this, what's the critical fraction that need to be vaccinated? And with a model like this, I did some scenarios. Um, and the scenarios basically show the, uh, the, the fraction, uh, or excuse me, the number of, of infectives starting at a single infective. And what you could see is with different fractions vaccinated, you get, um, different uh, trajectories. This last one should be 75%, excuse me. Um, um, so here's 70% vaccinated, 73%, 74%. 
And for all of those, you're seeing a bit of an expansion from the start. You get a bit of an outbreak. It's not that big, but you get a, a bit of an outbreak. It takes off upwards. But once you get to 75%, it, it starts to decline. And I want to show you where this number came from. Okay. Um, so, so the number is based on very simple reasoning. Um, and it's based on this key observation that at endemic equilibrium, F uh, times uh, the basic reproductive number equals one. Okay. Um, and uh, what, what we're going to do is we're going to set up uh, uh, set up a situation where we're going to be prepared for the for the worst case scenario. Okay, so consider an index infective, a, a, a single infective coming into the Saskatoon airport when no one else in the population is infected. And um, imagine that no one else is even permanently immune to the infection because of previous infection themselves. With something like COVID-19, um, there's excellent evidence. It's not uplifting evidence, but it's excellent scientific evidence that people's immunity wanes. And it tends to wane within about a year. It's not a good thing, but um, it is the fact. Just look at the, the case of Manaus in South America and Brazil, which had two outbreaks less than a year apart with the first one being horrifying and the second one being even more horrifying. Same city and uh, with studies suggesting 70, 70% of the population was infected the first time. Seven out of 10 people infected the first time, big outbreak less than a year later. Not a good sign. So imagine we don't want to rely on people's being recovered and immune. We don't want to rely on them being currently infected. We, we want the infection to not take hold. So we want to be prepared for this case where nobody has measles, nobody has COVID-19, nobody has chickenpox. That's what we're shooting for. And we want that to be a stable situation. With vaccination, we want to achieve that stability for that case. So how are we going to do this? Well, we have to keep the fraction susceptible so low that it doesn't allow the infection to take off. That even in this worst case where nobody's currently infected and nobody's recovered, we want enough people to be vaccinated that there's not enough susceptibles to allow the infection to gain a footing, to, to gain a beachhead, to take hold. And how are we going to do that? Well, nobody's effective, nobody's recovered. We want to keep the number of susceptibles low, so we need to vaccinate, right? Nobody infected, nobody recovered. All we've got is susceptibles vaccinated. We, we want to get susceptibles very low. All we got is vaccination. So we want the number vaccinated to be high enough that it keeps the susceptible fraction low enough that there's no way the infection is going to take off. Okay, we have all the pieces of the puzzle here. We have all the pieces of the puzzle based on our previous uh, discussion. And recall that we're going to denote F um, uh, being the fraction that, that are susceptible, okay? We're going to attempt to achieve this herd immunity by keeping that fraction susceptible low enough that it won't take hold. Now, it, it bears keeping in mind that herd immunity is a collective concept. It's a systems concept. Um, it's not about any one person. There's going to be, in fact, there's going to be susceptibles there uh, who can't get infected. That's not the point, though. The point is, as a whole, society can't get infected. Um, because it won't spread effectively. There'll be too many people around each infective who comes into the population to allow them to spread. So what we need to have happen is we need to keep, whoa, um, uh, the fraction who are susceptible low enough that F 
that the effective reproductive number remains below one. Because if it's above one, it will take off. If, if I'm replacing myself with two people before I recover, those two will replace themselves with two people. It'll go two to four to eight to 16, et cetera. And all these numbers that we have computer scientists love. Um, but we want the effective reproductive number to be less than one so that each effective can't even infect one person before they recover. So we want the effective reproductive number, which we said earlier is F, the fraction susceptible times the basic reproductive number to be less than one. Okay, so suppose we have a population that's divided into only susceptibles and vaccinated folks. We need the rest of them, if F is the fraction that are susceptible, we need the rest of them to be, to be um, immunized, right? Um, so we're gonna call the fraction we need immunized Q sub C, okay? Um, so that's weird notation, it is a bit weird. Um, so, so uh, and well, that's just the rest, that's one minus F, okay? Um, so we want F times R naught to be less than one which is just one minus QC times R naught less than one. So QC has to be greater than one minus one over R naught. Um, one over R naught is the fraction that if, if one over R naught people remain susceptible, uh, the effective reproductive number will be equal to one. So we need more we need fewer susceptibles than that. We need the, the number that are vaccinated to be greater than one minus that. Um, so in our case here, we had a basic reproductive number of four. And so in this case, we have, we need a fraction vaccinated of one minus one over four, right? So one minus 0.25, or we need 0.75 or 75% of the population to remain vaccinated, to be, to be immunized, um, which is exactly what we saw here. It's really as we approach this magic 75th threshold tipping point that we drive the, the disease to extinction. And it's because by vaccinating, we take them away from susceptibility and you need enough fuel. You need enough fire in that fireplace that's still burnable for it to combust. And so you need that one over R naught fraction here or else it, 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 the, the infective won't even infect one person before they recover. So vaccination, you want one minus one over R naught to be to be vaccinated, you want bigger than that. And that's where these numbers come from. You see it on the, the news, right? Um, so if you say, if you see Anthony Fauci saying, we need 75% of the population to be vaccinated, he's assuming an R naught of, of four. Um, if, if they say two thirds, they're assuming an R naught of three. Um, now there's some slight caveats here. If we have high population turnover, which is unlikely within the course of a year, then we need to start, you know, thinking about factoring that into our calculations. But essentially, this critical immunization fraction comes from that reasoning. It comes from this idea that we're dealing with the worst case scenario where we can't count on anyone being out of the running for infection because they're infected or recovered. And all we've got is vaccination to protect. Everyone else will otherwise be susceptible. And we need to drain the number that are susceptible so that the effective reproductive number is below one. That's where that all comes down from. And this is the criteria for the effective reproductive number. And it just falls out that the balance of them, one minus one over the basic reproductive number has to at least be vaccinated. So um, this is a simplification. And when we're dealing with agent-based models uh, starting next time, what we're going to see is that um, 
this approximation is pretty good, but it will tend to break down. Let's suppose there's a certain fraction of the population that lives in very crowded housing, for example. Their basic reproductive number in that housing may be a lot bigger than one. Maybe there's a certain fraction of the population for whom beta is very high because they don't have good access to sanitation. Maybe it's homeless individuals or individuals suffering from, from challenges with substance abuse. Maybe it's um, uh, individuals who are immunocompromised and where the chance of getting infected is much greater than for your average individual. And therefore C times beta times tau, the basic reproductive number uh, for them is going to be you know, in a population of those sorts of people is going to be higher. Um, you may be dealing with situations of people of disproportionate number of contacts, whether they be social butterflies or whether they be healthcare workers who have to see COVID infected patient after COVID infected patient per day. All of these will suggest that um, you know, while this may be a good approximation for the population as a whole, maybe there are some groups we have to spend a special care on to get them especially well vaccinated. And if you're wondering why the, pop, the province is vaccinating healthcare workers and people in Northern communities who disproportionately suffer from poorer housing and lower ventilated housing, um, uh, more crowded conditions, um, you will, you will recognize that it makes sense because while this number may work overall, we need to especially focus vaccination in those communities. We also need to focus the communities whose uh, immunization status is less strong like the elderly. Um, so uh, here though, we have the, the key um, criteria. Now, I haven't looked at the effect of ongoing vaccination and we should do so. All we've been dealing with here is one time vaccination. Let's look at if we have an annual percentage of vaccination. Now I put some parameters in here in case any of you would, would like to try your hand at this. Um, uh, in fact, I'm tempted to give you a little take home exercise involving this for next week. Um, so if we, if we start vaccination off um, and we have it continuing on an ongoing basis, no one started vaccinated. We have to build that up. Sound familiar? Um, so here, based on our rate of vaccination, like 50% of the population per year versus 40%, that's red, versus 20%, that's green, versus 10%, uh, that's gray, we build up different fractions of the population uh, vaccinated. This is what's going on in our province, even as I speak. And the challenge here is you've got to race against time, right? And if you can outrace the spread of COVID-19, including COVID-19 variants, ladies and gentlemen, you may be in a situation where you can just bring this current outbreak down and lay it to rest and you don't get any more outbreaks. You're flying ahead of that plane, you're, you're vaccinating ahead, you're, you're um, moving faster than the bug. By contrast, if you had no vaccination, you get an initial outbreak and you get subsequent outbreaks. And if you have lower rates of vaccination, um, let's say 20% per year, that's the green here, um, you may get a low dip for a while, which makes us think, okay, we're past the danger. And then you get an outbreak again um, occurring uh, when conditions uh, have built up enough susceptibles and enough, uh, enough um, uh, individuals coming into the population, uh, excuse me, enough uh, infectives building up. And so you might get an outbreak, say, of the fall. Um, and, and then it might oscillate towards some sort of uh, endemic equilibrium for now, because vaccination is trying to keep up with population turnover. For COVID-19, vaccination also has to keep up with waning of immunity. 
people losing immunity who previously had it. So not only do you have an open population, people leaving, people coming in, but you have people going from R back to S, like we saw last time, um, and, and therefore having to be vaccinated again, just like with the annual flu vaccine. If you have only 10% per year, you also get uh, an outbreak, but it's sooner. It's later than if there were no vaccination, but it's sooner. And then you get uh, more oscillations in a higher endemic level. We haven't managed to outrace the, um, the bug in this case. Um, the fraction of susceptibles oscillates uh, notably here. And very interestingly, if you vaccinate more people, um, you can actually get, you might think it leads to more susceptibles, but actually it's not the case. It's true that vaccinating more people will, will prevent infection. It will lower infection and keep people susceptible uh, for longer who would have otherwise gotten infected. But you're also shifting people to vaccinated. So you're draining susceptibles that way. So for example, if you're really doing very aggressive vaccination, you're gonna be drawing down the number of susceptibles because they're disproportionately getting vaccinated. It's not because they're getting infected, it's because they're getting vaccinated. Um, meanwhile, um, uh, if you have less vaccination, you might have more susceptibles, but, but it might still be stable enough to bring it down and, and outrun it. But if you're not quick enough, go from blue at 50% of the population per year to, to, to red at 40%, and then you start getting it to things like the green or the black or the gray, where you've got a lot less vaccination and the bug starts to lead to subsequent outbreaks, right? And you're, you're not outrunning it. You're going towards an endemic equilibrium. You never achieve herd immunity, but you may bring the number of infectives low enough that you could confer care for the population. The ICUs aren't full you don't run out of ventilators or more likely earlier uh, trained nurses who are trained in the ICU. Um, and instead it, it oscillates uh, towards some endemic equilibrium, which keeps the fraction of susceptible low because they get infected. Okay, um, I don't think I will um, uh, go into this example at all, but I would note that riffing off the same model one could readily represent isolation of infectives, right? So when people get infected, you quarantine them, but you've got to detect them first. And so there might be some time until they get quarantined. And maybe you take them out of, you, you put them in quarantine and therefore they have less contact with the population. This is another common situation with COVID. It tends to work well in small households, for example. Um, often um, households which have a larger home, um, it tends not to work very well in a very crowded home where 15 people are living in the same home, three persons to a row. Um, it also tends to not work well with homeless people, etc. So quarantining um, will take people out of circulation though, um, to a degree. And you could look at, you know, how does that uh, affect things? And uh, it's going to depend on the time needed to identify people for quarantine. Um, for example, if we can identify people fast enough, we may drive the bug out of existence. But if we're not quite fast enough, um, it may still lead to some outbreaks, uh, but it'll be small compared to the, uh, to the to the outbreak size we'd otherwise see. This is fraction of susceptible in the, the population. And we could see that quarantining, for example, can bring it, um, uh, can, can, it can end up uh, affecting it, but raise it over what would be, um, what would come out of a baseline uh, scenario. If we quarantine enough people, the fraction susceptible can be very high, but if we don't quite quarantine enough, we'll still get outbreaks but more will remain susceptible than would otherwise. Okay, um, so those are some um, 
topics for today. We saw solving for equilibria, um, uh, an approach to systematically identifying the states of the system at which it's in balance. And we noted at a higher level that this is something very powerful on account of the fact to be able to reason for any number of bugs with different Cs, different and contexts, different Cs, different betas, different taus, different you know, recovery times, different times to lose immunity. We could reason about how would the equilibria locations be different as to how many people are sick in endemic equilibrium. And we could extend that to stability. Oh, under what conditions it's stable. Um, but we also looked at vaccination and we introduced, we, we harked back to this issue of the critical parameter. Um, this, per, or it's not a parameter, it's a critical quantity. It's the fraction that remains susceptible, S over N. That fraction is everything within this sort of modeling. It limits the ability for infectives to spread directly. And it means that, uh, and it relates the effective reproductive number to the basic one. And for vaccination, we wanted it to be such that even if an infected people came, person came into the population and nobody had was recovered for COVID, nobody was sick with it, they still wouldn't spread it. And in order to reason about that, we reasoned what is the fraction of the population which, uh, if it if it remains susceptible, it it won't catch. Um, below which it, it just won't catch. And that fraction was given by uh, one over the effect of the basic reproductive number. Below that fraction, the effective reproductive number will be less than one, and the infection will die down. And so we saw we need to vaccinate the rest of the people. So it's one minus one over R naught is the fraction you need to vaccinate at, when viewed as a whole. Next time we'll be diving in to the extra details afforded by an individual level representation where we can represent networks, geography, spatial relationships and interactions, where we can characterize an individual's history and make how we treat them for example, in terms of prioritizing them for treatment or vaccination, um, depend on aspects of their past history, something which it's infeasible to really maintain within a compartmental model, other than remembering, has anyone been infected ever before or not? Um, we will also look at uh, agent-based models as ways for capturing nested structure uh, things like schools, uh, so people, people within homes, within neighborhoods, with, you know, associated with schools, associated with cities, associated with regions, where you could have this nested hierarchy that mirrors the, the nesting in the world, and where there may be dynamics applied and processes applied at different levels. That all lies b before us with individual based modeling. But uh, this concludes our central focus on this module of kind of mathematics of infectious disease, we may return as time allows for a discussion of stability. But these principles are gonna carry over to agent-based modeling directly, just with a twist. And we won't be able to derive those nice equations for location of endemic equilibria, for example, or disease-free, but we will want to draw on these intuitions about herd immunity, about critical immunization fraction, about the fraction that are susceptible um, for reasoning about, uh, about uh, infectious disease models and, and, and ABMs. Okay, so we're gonna see you next time. Uh, I may circulate a further exercise for you over the weekend. Um, and I look forward to seeing some of you in office hours. Thanks very much. I'll be restarting this, uh, this session uh, in office hours in about five minutes. Thanks.